Hey, what's up, students? Today, we're going to talk about angular momentum and impulse. We're going to look at three different types of examples about how we can solve for momentum and impulse, especially when it comes to the way they ask questions on the AP exam and how this relates to the linear things that we've done earlier in the year. With that said, let's jump right into that linear stuff and remember what we already know. We learned earlier in the year that momentum is equal to P where this P or rho was equal to mass times velocity. And we saw later to change momentum, delta P was equal to some F net for some amount of time. And we called this impulse, and it was a capital J. And then some side notes we learned that momentum is conserved if there's no outside forces acting on the system. So these linear relationships are what we are going to want to bring right now into angular momentum and impulse. And, and all we're going to do now, like we've done with rotational dynamics and rotational kinematics, is we're going to take these linear relationships, we're going to give them new variables that refer to rotation, and then we're going to keep the same exact concepts true. So first now we're going to look at angular momentum. Angular momentum is not going to be known by rho. It's going to be known by capital L. So momentum is rho p. Angular momentum is L. Now for M, we have learned that we have something that's similar to M or inertia. We have something called the moment of inertia, which is capital I. Now remember, you do not need to memorize capital I for certain things. I'm going to give it to you as long as you remember the basic one for a single particle, which is MR squared. But for any other thing, a disc, a rod, a sphere, I'm going to tell you what this I is. And there's also going to be another way that we can solve for that. So instead of inertia, we use the moment of inertia. Now, what is the velocity or speed component when it comes to rotation? That is omega. So now we have ourselves a relationship for angular momentum in terms of rotation using the same footprint that we use in linear motion. So we have L equals I omega is the synonymous with rho equals mv. Now let's do the exact same thing with the change momentum. So now instead of delta rho, I'm going to write delta L. Now for F net, what is the force that causes objects to want to spin? Well, that is simply torque. And times a scalar, it does not care about direction, spinning. So now we can say delta T. So the impulse or angular impulse is going to be equal to torque times the change in time. So if I want to change how much an object is spinning, I want to change the momentum of that object, I need to apply a torque for some time. Just like if I want to change an object's momentum, I applied net force for some time, which we called impulse. And we can call this impulse as well. It doesn't have a J. We just call it delta L in this case. And if you remember back when we did this, on the reference table, there really was no J. We just gave it a name. Change momentum just has a name, which is really just impulse. So now we look at this last relationship, and we can say the same exact thing. Angular momentum is conserved. Okay, so once again, using the review for momentum... Here's everything we need to know. Now, in the AP exam, they're more worried about qualitative predictions. So we're not necessarily going to be solving for things, okay? And we see this over and over again as we keep practicing these AP classroom questions. Is they're more worried about you being able to understand what happens when I change situations, making predictions if I add mass, change speed, this, that, and the other thing. So what I want to do is I want to look at three different distinct types of examples that don't exactly solve for a number. They just show relationships. Relationships. Okay, so here's two graphs, and I'm going to graph torque versus time in both of these. Torque versus time. And the question wants to know, what is the change momentum of these two graphs? And the reason I drew them is because we have one simple line here, and then we have another one that kind of changes and goes up and down. So if I asked you, what is the change in momentum, you would say very simply, well, I just learned that delta L is equal to torque times an amount of time. So I would say, all right, well, I applied six Newton meters of torque and I did so for one second. Okay, so now I could say that the change momentum was six Newton meter seconds. But just as a little trick to us, we see that would be the same as saying base times height, essentially. The area under the curve, if this is height and this is the base, right, we just took the area under this curve. So the area equaled the change in L. 
Now you can remember that the area under a curve of a torque versus time graph is delta L, or you can solve for it. I want to show you both ways in case you wanted to use a trick. And we can test that again here with a change in torque. I would first break this down into two segments. And I would say from here to here, I would need to know the average torque. So torque initial is equal to zero Newton meters. Torque final is equal to six Newton meters. So I can say torque average is equal to zero plus six over two or three Newton meters. That would be the average torque. So when I look at delta L for the first segment, I would say the average torque is three Newton meters. And I did that for 0.4 seconds. So that equaled 1.2 Newton meter seconds. Now for the second segment, I could say delta L equals. Well, here if I look at the T average, T average now is gonna be six plus zero over two. So once again, that is gonna be equal to three Newton meters. So now delta L is gonna be equal to that three Newton meters. But now it's going to be equal to 0.6 seconds, which is going to be equal to 1.8 Newton meter seconds. So the total change in L is going to be 3 Newton meters seconds. Now, would that have worked if I used the area under the curve? Well, we see this is the one half right here because the average was really one half times six, right? One half, this is the height, times the base, which was 0.4. So in fact, if I took the area under here, that would be 1.2 Newton meter seconds, and this would be 1.8 Newton meter seconds, and they're both in the positive quadrant, so we'd sum them up, and that was that. So we need to, one thing that we can remember, if we want, we can either use it by doing the average and taking the sums of the parts, or we can remember that the area under a curve of a torque versus time graph gives you delta L. And you can do this if you want. Like I said, you can remember this trick or you could just solve for it using the formula just like this. To be honest, I use the formula because I can never remember what area is under what. But what you do need to know is when you come from here to here in this first triangle, you have to take the average torque. Where here you don't have to take the average because it stayed constant. So the average was six the entire time. Let's look at a problem with just a little bit more words and one of those classic AP questions now that just looks so wordy. Okay, so here's an example right from the AP classroom. A uniform disc with the mass M0 and radius R0 is mounted on a vertical axis so it can rotate freely in a horizontal plane. The rotational inertia of the disc is I0. The disc is initially at rest. If the force F0 is applied tangentially to the rim of the disc for a time delta T, the final angular momentum of the disc is L0. Okay, so those are pretty much just the facts of the case. Now, here's where the question really asks what's going on here. Once again, this is qualitative. They're not asking us to exactly solve for something. They want to know, if I consider a second disc, so now I have a different situation, and the mass is the same, but the radius is twice, and the rotational inertia also changes, what happens if I apply the same force, same amount of time, what would the change in angular momentum be? first thing I want to do is I want to look at the two different scenarios. For the first scenario, we know that now a change in momentum is equal to some torque for some delta t. And we can express torque as either I alpha or the traditional, the first way, F times R. Now, in this case, I wasn't really given anything to tell me about A, but I was given R's and F's. So this is the relationship that I'm going to want to use for this particular problem. So now I can say that if torque is now going to be equal to R naught times F naught. Okay, and that was just given here. R naught, F naught. I don't need any masses yet, but this is how I'm going to represent torque. Now delta L is simply torque delta t. So now we can make an expression for the change to be r naught, f naught, delta t. That is going to be equal to delta L. But there was a really, really important thing here that didn't look so important, and that was this. 
So if the initial speed omega naught was equal to zero rads per second, that would mean that the final L would just be equal to the change, right? If I had like three seconds and zero seconds, this would be time initial, this would be time final. If I wanted to find the change, it would just be time final. So now instead of representing this as delta L, I'm going to represent it as L naught, the final angular momentum of the disk. So that is going to be equal to R naught, F naught, delta T. And this is for scenario one. That is the final momentum of the disk right now. Now let's hop over and look at the second scenario. If we use the same kind of setup, we see that now the torque is going to be equal to 2 R0, F0, right? Because we have the same mass. We don't really need mass because we didn't really use any inertias. But we say the same force, the same amount of time, but now we have twice the radius. So that's going to be the torque now. So now delta L is going to be, once again, torque to R0, F0 times delta T. And for the same reasons, it starts at rest. So now I can say that L final for the second scenario was equal to 2 R0, F0, delta T. But they want this in terms, our answer to be in terms of this. So what do I know that's equal about both of these? I see that T is equal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this initial blue one here, and I'm going to say that L0 over R0, F0, that would equal T, right? I just divided both sides. That must be equal now because the T's are equal, the delta times. We have L0 in the second scenario, which is 2 R0, F0. So if I multiply both sides by 2 R0, F0, I'm able to cancel these out. And I see now that the L0 final, the L0 in the second scenario, is equal to 2 L0. Here's our answer right here. Now, guys, I, I picked this because it's super, super important to see that we didn't need I. Sometimes they're going to give you information that you don't need an I. Now, it turned out this was a multi-part question, so later on we did use the I. But guys, remember, you don't always need to use the information given to you. That's super important on the AP. They are notorious for giving you too much information and then freaking you out because you didn't use something. But this right here is the answer. So essentially, we had the same forces. All we did was change the R, and we just compared the two, set them up as ratios. I set the two Ts equal to one another because that's what they're equal and then I just cross multiplied, divided, and here's how I got my answer. One more question now where we actually have to solve for a number, and it looks a lot scarier than it is. And you'll have to forgive me, my drawing skills are not excellent, but you will get the idea. Okay, so here's essentially what's happening. We have a disc that's spinning, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop an identical disc on top of it. This disc is gonna be spinning, I drop this disc on top of it, it starts spinning, and these two discs become this picture. So we, we have this disc that's spinning at 30 radians per second. We drop this disc on, and then the angular speed becomes W1. Then I take another identical disc, and I drop it on top. So these are essentially like little collisions, but they're angular collisions, not like the linear ones we saw before. But the angular momentum still must be conserved. And they want to know what is W2. So now we have three identical discs that are spinning in a circle at some omega and I want to know what that is. Now, the way we solve for this, if we remember back when, when P before equaled P after, and then we just found the momentum of the carts, MV, MV, and we did that for the amount of carts, and we got down to an answer, we were able to solve for one of the variables. Usually, we had to solve for V. We are going to do the exact same thing for collisions, but angular collisions. Now, instead of P before, P after, we are going to say we have some initial L, momentum before, and that has to equal momentum after. Now, how do we solve for momentum? Well, here we did mv. In angular momentum, we do that by saying i w. So I have some initial, and then I have some final. Initial i, and that was multiplied by 30 rads per second. Now, these are identical disks, right? 
so that the moment of inertia is going to be the same, but now we just have three times the I. So now we have an I, an I, and an I. Where here I just had that one initial I. So what I'll say now is that we have three I naught, and that has to be equal to some W2 or W final. If I then divide by three I naught, We get some cancellations here. Then this goes zero, this goes to 10, and we see that W2 equals 10 rads per second. The reason I chose this one is because the picture looks so much scarier and so much more confusing, but then when you do the math, it took like two seconds to get the math done. So here's a great example of, guys, write down what you know, follow the rules that you've seen before, and you should be good to go. It's actually one of these situations where the less math is actually a bit better. We get to cancel out some variables. It's freaking awesome. Cancel these out. We're left with W2 equals 10 rads per second. If you have any other questions, guys, leave them in the comments below. If this helped you learned anything, please give the video a thumbs up. It tells YouTube that there's some good content here and other people should watch it as well. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.